Hi, welcome to War Christ. This is a channel dedicated to Catholics, Protestants, and Orthodox alike. Today I'm joined by Dr. Mark Thurlin. Mark is an Irish philosopher, a writer, and a newspaper columnist, a specialist in continental philosophy, theology, and the philo uh, philosophy of religion. He's the author of several books, including The Politics of Exodus, Kierkegaard's Ethics of Responsibility, Roger Scruton, the philosopher of Dover Beach, and Why Be a Catholic. So I'd love to just begin today by asking you about your work on Roger Scruton, Mark, especially as um, as I say, we're seem to be undergoing this cultural revolution of the kind that Roger warned about. So you've written a, a number of books about Roger, uh, the one about the philosopher in Dover Beach that I mentioned, the Roger Scruton Reader you edited, and um, Conversations with Roger Scruton also. What first drew you to Roger Scruton then? Well, uh, my first introduction to him was way back in the early 90s. I was just starting to uh, teach out in uh, University College Dublin, where I was a lecturer for 10 years. And he came to give, uh, as a young man then, um, the uh, endowed lecture series, uh, annual endowed lecture series called the Agnes Cumming Lecture Series. And very huge notables came along each year. You know, people like Noam Chomsky and Jacques Derrida, and people like this who would be world famous. And um, the next thing, Roger Scruton appeared. And I hadn't heard of Roger Scruton before, and like 90% of people who were there hadn't heard of Roger Scruton mm -hmm. before. He wasn't a, a world famous name at that stage. But I do remember that there was something there. I know I have met all the great thinkers and philosophers of the latter half of the 20th century. I'm very lucky in that respect, but I have met them, and I became good friends with a lot of them. But this man, something, I mean, it's more than charisma. It was a self-assurance when he walked into the room. He was like something from the 19th century. He reminded me, I was writing a book on Kierkegaard at the time. Um, he reminded me of Solomon Kierkegaard. He wore a, 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 a waistcoat and, a, and a, a, a pocket watch, you know, and, you know, the licked up with them. He had the little glasses. He spoke on music, the aesthetics of music. And it wasn't the normal type of stuff that you'd expect from people who spoke about music in those days, which would be, contemporary music and smashing the old idiom of music and so forth. This guy spoke unashamedly about classical music and why we need it, not only as a form of entertainment, but as a, as a form of moral education and, uh, and a stability uh, in, in our lives that roots us to something greater than ourselves, a tradition, in other words. And I found this extraordinary because just at that time, um, the you, you mentioned what we're going through now as a cultural revolution. That cultural revolution has been going on a long time. In fact, it's been going on ever since Mark, Marx poured his poison over the world. And then subsequently, in the diabolical manifestation of uh, Mao Zedong uh, in, in China. And when I started out uh, teaching and writing and so on, uh, there were a fair few of my colleagues, uh, not personally, but across the academic spectrum writ large, who used to sport Mao's little red book of ideology on their bookshelves. And students, the first thing that would hit them when they come into the room was this thing. So instead of classical texts, you had this revolutionary treatise, which was calling on, on them to smash their own civilization or their own society, their traditions, their customs, and so on. So for this man to be coming in at that stage, when that was all the kind of rage, the chic rage, now it's come to full fruition now in, 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 a, in a more concrete sense, but uh, on the streets of, of the Western world. But in those days, it was intellectual and it was kind of fomenting in, in the academic circles. And he came along and he, he opposed it. And his very person opposed it. It wasn't just an intellectual argument he was making. He opposed it in his person. He exhibited everything in his person that was contrary to this, what he, what he subsequently called the spirit of uh, the culture of repudiation. His whole persona just rejected that. And I said to myself, this is an astonishing testament to a way of life that is under siege. And yet here he is, a lonesome figure defending that way of life against opposition of an incredible nature. Because as I said to you earlier, Mark, the academy, the intellectual academy, was uh, the, the, the furnace in which all these fires were burning at that stage. So that's what initially drew me to him. Uh, I saw commitment. Very few academics have commitment. They speak a lot and they tell you what you ought to do and how you ought to live, but they don't walk the talk. And here was Roger Scruton walking the talk and that really impressed me. 
I mean, well, thank God. And um, why do you think the conservative instinct sharpened for him during the Paris riots of 68? And what did it mean for him to um, oppose the culture of repudiation at that time? Well, you see, the thing about it is, you've got to ask yourself, to answer that question is rather easy, actually, because ask yourself, what sharpens your opposition to what's going on in our world today? You look and you see destruction. You see diabolical manifestations of repudiation. Not only just political, it's not based on politics, it's based on a deep-rooted ideology that hates everything about our civilization and, and the West and the religious, uh, socio-religious roots uh, of that tr tradition and is prepared to pull them up at whatever cost. So you have to ask yourself, the same scenes, and thank God he was spared at uh, he died in, in January uh, of this year. Um, he, and I, I, was, I stayed a weekend with him shortly before that in his farm in Wilshire. And we discussed many things, but we didn't discuss this because it hadn't manifested yet. Neither had COVID, thank God. So we didn't live to see that either. Um, so the, the, the fact is that um, we have a situation now where uh, we can see what he saw in Paris in the 1960s. You know, thugs out in the street, pulling up pavements, uh, attacking the police, attacking courthouses, decapitating statues, pulling them down, not only de political statues, decapitating statues of, of the Virgin Mary and of Christ and of saints and so on and so forth, diabolical things. And uh, you say to yourself, is that what you want in society? You, you know, Mark, you say that to yourself. Is that the type of society that you want to live in, uh, in, in Portland, for example? Or do you want to live in the settled communities uh, of the Western world, um, which have matured over millennia uh, and are a beacon of light to the rest of the world about uh, you know, freedom, uh, rights, civilization, respect, responsibility, and so forth? And there is a sharp contrast, let me tell you, a sharp contrast. I suppose less, obviously, than uh, what were some of his central concerns that made him target uh, liberals in the tradition of Russell and Mill? Well, it, it, was, it was greater than that. I think it was just liberalism per se. And of course, as you know, every uh, political ideology has various strands. It's not, you know, one size fits all. So they were, in fact, he had great respect for Russell and Mill, um, uh, Bertrand Russell and John Stuart Mill, that is, insofar as they weren't part of the cultural repudiation as such. John Stuart Mill has been appropriated by many to uh, push that agenda subsequently. But these were men really of the 19th century, although Russell was a uh, towering figure of the 20th, but they really were of a different age. Um, uh, they, they, they may have rejected uh, you know, the, 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 the religious uh, orthodoxy of the age, but they weren't prepared to pull it down. You know, they respected people's right to practice religion if they so wished and so on. So it was liberalism per se, and basically what he felt was, and he's right about this, that liberals, like everybody else, are a product of a culture. They're a product of a home, okay? So they come from a settled environment uh, where they're nourished on um, old time values, old time customs, um, a settled way of life, a sense of belonging to their communities and to the earth and so on. Uh, and they're, they, they are, so you've got to ask, what allows the liberal spirit to emerge? You know, what, what permits it to function, to mature? It's the very way of life that it opposes. Do you see? Liberals are created like everybody else uh, is created. You know, that we, come, we come from a context, and the context, the, 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 the context that they rejected, the context that, um, that they dislike is the very context that allow them the freedom to flourish as liberals, okay? So, um, uh, so they are, a, 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 he used to call them, they, uh, he used to say of, liberal, of, the, of the liberal that the liberal is an artifact. He is, he is created, he is made from the very soil of the thing that he rejects. Mm -hmm. uh, the family, the state, the civil society, all of those things that they repudiate and deny. And reject and so the liberal is a product of that so uh you, you know it's it's like um the teenager 
um, he often used this analogy, the teenager who at a certain point in time said, I'm fed up with this home, I'm fed up with my parents, I can't stand them, I can't stand everything they've taught me. And they go into this mode of rejection uh, and uh, they want alienation from everything they have known. And of course, I think most of us go through that at a certain stage in our lives. He said that, and I think quite rightly, that uh, liberals get stuck in that position. You know, because normally you go through that in your teenage years, if, you're, if, if, you, if you do, and then you return again and you see the value of home, you see the value of what it is that created you and allowed you and gave you the rights and freedoms to flourish in this way and to reject. You have a right uh, under the old Western um, way of life to reject your way of life. You know, you don't get, you don't have that right in autocratic societies mm -hmm. or even theocratic societies. Uh, you're punished, you're executed for it. Um, and the very societies that the, the liberal law and such a socialist society, the communist society, do you have that right there? No, you certainly do not. You toe the party line or you're sent off to some camp or other. Uh, and that's the best outcome for you, I can assure you. Um, but the way of life that the liberal rejects is the very way of life that allows him to reject that way of life, um, ironically. So, but the, the, the liberal gets stuck in this uh, state of repudiation and never recovers from it. So you've got old men and old women still going around shouting revolution uh, and, and rejecting their parents in, in the metaphorical sense and their past and their belonging and so on, when they should have uh, well grown out of it. So that's the liberal condition. Now, as I, as I say, it's not one size fits all. There are very sophisticated liberals and, uh, uh, you know, people like John Rawls and so on, who uh, spoke very technically about the liberal condition. Um, uh, you've got people like Tony Blair and Bill Clinton who are liberals, but they didn't want to destroy the society of which they're a part. And then you've got people like Bernie Saunders and uh, Jeremy Corbyn who do want to destroy <laughs> the society of which they're a part. Too long in the tooth to be doing that, in my opinion, but there you are. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, what about the existentialists like Sartre then and some of the more postmodernists in the fashion of Foucault, people like that? Mm -hmm. What were some of the movements you had with those figures or with that um, ideology? Well, again, uh, it, it was the, these people were slightly different, a, a little bit more menacing, according to, to Roger, because uh, they attempted to do something much more profound, and that is to uh, scrape, as he called it, the sacred from the surface of the earth. Okay, scrape away the sacred. Um, in other words, reduce everything to either bare humanism in the case of Sartre, okay, uh, man is what he makes of himself, Sartre's famous uh, phrase, uh, with no author or no, you know, nothing over and beyond that conditions us, we are our sole creators. Uh, and in the case of Foucault, to deny, uh, for all his sophistication, and Foucault was sophisticated, let me tell you, but to deny that there is anything that, that we could, that we really are reduced at the end of the day to our animal essentials, you know, that, uh, uh, and, and, and so the, the, the postmodern instinct for him, at least now, I tried to convince him that there were people within that tradition that weren't as um, uh, revolutionary in that regard as he believed, and that they were kind of fellow travelers to a degree. Um, hard to do that, but I think I managed that. Um, because he was so set against them. Um, he, 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 he wrote a book in the 1980s called Thinkers of the New Left, in which he deals with people like Sartre, uh, Gramsci, and Foucault, and others. And this, it caused him a lot of trouble. He lost his academic career over it. Um, he was uh, hated uh, and vilified. He was a, a, a columnist for the Times in London at that time. Uh, and it really did bring a lot of opprobrium down upon his head. Uh, I, in, in my wisdom, just provoked him to write a second edition of the book, but he was much more established at this stage and his views had taken on a kind of a currency of their own. Um, and we settled on the title one evening in London called Fools, Frauds and Firebrands. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what he felt about a lot of these people. But he did believe in a lot of them were geniuses nonetheless. Um, and they were. Um, the fact is that they used their genius uh, to um, uh, undermine the sacred roots and the sacred origins of society as he saw it. And there was something more to human beings uh, than uh, their animal instincts, you know? 
And this is what this is the central theme of his writings that uh, for a conservative that you you know you will you you can recreate anything if you think that that thing is nothing more than a human artifact. Um, but if you see in it something greater than those who made it, that it is invested not only with the consciousness of those who made it, but it's, it almost speaks to you like your home or the institutions or the history of a nation that's enshrined in symbols and statues, right? And, and, and laws and, and customs. If you see those customs speaking back to you with, with uh, like, like as, as Edmund Burke called them, as canonized forefathers, then you'll be less likely to tear them down. You'll have respect for them. Uh, you'll have reverence for them, and you'll have uh, you'll see them as endowed with authority, uh, because they speak of something greater than you, and what you want, right? Which is another of the the the, the, uh, uh, the instincts of of, of the, the liberal condition. You know, the, me myself and I, as if you know the I can function without being a part of the we, mm -hmm. the third person plural. Um, so, uh, so 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 to, to scrape away the sacred, as he called it. Um, and this is very, this goes back to the philosopher Hegel in the 19th century. To scrape away that is to kind of see, uh, you know, is, 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 is to kind of, uh, and he saw this primarily in, in terms of um, uh, one of his great themes, sex. He wrote a book called Sexual Desire in 1986, which was very powerful and very provocative, but uh, the first really comprehensive treatment of sex, which opposed Freud and Alfred Kinsey and people like that. This was done from moral and uh, from a, a kind of quasi-theological perspective. Uh, and so there's two ways of looking at it. Either you, you uh, are attracted to the person, okay, which is not distinct from the body or the flesh, but is mingled with the body and the flesh, mm -hmm. or you're attracted to the flesh, and you don't believe that there is a person mingled with the flesh. There's nothing extra other than the flesh. Now think of the consequences for looking at the human being in either sense. If you think that you're only dealing with flesh, then that opens up to abuse, all sorts of things. You can do anything with flesh. I mean, look what we do to animals. Uh, you can manipulate the flesh. You can disregard the flesh. You can abuse the flesh. Uh, but if you think, and if you believe, and if you know, and I think most of us have this instinct, if we don't, there's something uh, dysfunctional about us. And this was the point of his book. If you reach beyond the flesh into what you're striving to grasp when you love somebody, which is the person. Because that person, you see, flesh is replaceable, but personhood is irreplaceable, okay? Let's say if you're married and you're having uh, sexual relations with your wife, uh, you're not having sexual relations with the lump of flesh. You're loving the person in the flesh. Mm -hmm. Because if it was only the flesh, then your wife could go very easily go next door and uh, uh, grab some other flesh, but she doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. Why? Because she's committed to the person mingled in the flesh. There's only one person in the flesh. There's only one unique perspective in the flesh. That person will never be replicated, and that is the same. We don't, we can't touch it, we can't feel it, but we reach beyond ourselves in every respect when we face the great monuments of civilization, when we go to we face artworks, when we face children, when we face human beings, when we face our loves, we see it each time. Something extra that we reach beyond. We reach beyond the concrete. We reach beyond the canvas. We reach beyond the flesh to something that is, it is mingled in it. Now break apart the flesh and you won't find the person. Break apart the canvas. You won't find the painted saint. Mm -hmm. But when the flesh is there, as a person or as a human being, when the canvas is there in all its beauty, then you see it. So it's, as he used to say, you know, human being is not two things, a person and flesh, but one thing that can be looked at in two different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Sartre and Foucault will look at it one way, in a bad way. Uh, you, as uh, a Scrutonian, or as a follower of Christ or a follower of, of, of Hegel or whoever it is, will look at it in another way. You'll see the person mingled with the flesh. And that's what makes it safe. Beautiful. Thank you, Mark. Um, aside from that, that's, that's one outstanding appeal of uh, Roger's work, I would, say, or I would agree. Um, are there any other particular ideas that you have found particularly ennobling for your own life, Mark? Well, it, yes. Uh, I mean, the, the excuse me, the 
the, the, I subsequently uh, wrote a, a book called Moral Matters, The Philosophy of Homecoming in 2015, or 15, yes, I think it was published. And that was a kind of a small treatise uh, on, on the same type of themes, because the, the, the concept of home uh, is one that was very close to Roger's heart, but it was also, it's also very close to the conservative heart. Now, when I say conservative, I don't want people to think of, uh, you know, Margaret Thatcher, although she is very important, or uh, I want you to think of conservation, right? So um, it makes it much more appealing. So what did the conservationists do? The conservationists, whether it be the ecological conservationists or the cultural conservationists, tries to conserve what is already there, okay? Um, uh, so the, the cultural conservationists will go around trying to conserve ancient monuments and houses and so forth and so on. That speak to us of our history and our identity. The uh, ecological conservationists will try to conserve the natural habitat. Right, uh, the, the, the created world in which we live. Now, the uh, the, 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 the conservationist um, who looks at things in the, in the round will try to conserve or preserve those things which human history has delivered to us as a gift. Okay, so we see it as a gift, and we are we see it as Edmund Burke says that we you know we look upon things as stewards. So we steward the artistic heritage. We steward that we have, that has been bequeathed to us by our forebears. We steward the religious, cultural, uh, um, uh, social, political uh, heritage that's been sent down to us, or passed down to us from uh, uh, previous generations, from what Edmund Burke called absent generations. Why do we do that? Why do, do, do you know, the, the liberal will say they are arbitrary, that they're, they're just man-made, they, you know, they have no firm foundations, uh, and therefore they can be destroyed or discarded in the morning. Well, you see, the problem is, from that perspective, that leaves us blind. It leaves us without signposts. Because all of these things are rich tapestries of human trial and error. Okay? Uh, so in the case of the law, let's say, the law is, as we know it now, let's say the common law, uh, uh, is, 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 is a record of where we went wrong and where we went right. So the judge sits down, he says, I'm going to try, and, I'm going to try this case. Um, uh, and uh, what does he do? He, he doesn't merely look at statutes, he looks at precedents. What's the nearest thing to this particular case that's happened before? And let's look at that, that particular, and see how it was resolved, mm -hmm. right? So it's a precedent, it's a guide it's a guide from the past about what we ought to do in the future. And everything that we receive from the past is like that. You know, it's, 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 it's a history or a tapestry, a rich tapestry of our accomplishments and of our failures to show us where we went wrong and how we ought to go right. Okay? If you're depending solely on your reason, uh, and this is Burke's great critique of the French revolutionaries, if you're depending solely on your reason, then you're going to lead us to disaster because your reason is blind. Okay, it's 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 vacuous. It's empty. It's got nothing to fill it. It's got nothing. You know, reason has to have concrete evidence to focus on and to make you know a reason judgment about something. So I can look, for example, at the uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm coming back to home now in a second. This is all by way of showing you about how home is much more than my home or your home. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big concept. Uh, for example, I can look at music and the heritage of music, and I can say to you, well, you can say to me, well, look, there's no distinction between classical music and rap. I can say, well, that's absurd. Mm -hmm. You say, no, 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 no. I love rap. You like classical music. These are subjective likes and dislikes, so we'll agree to disagree. There's no objective standard to judge between them. Well, of course there is. And you say to me, well, what is that? Uh, apart from the fact that uh, it makes you feel good and rap makes me feel good. I'll say, no. It, you know, you, in order to judge something, you look at the fruit of that thing. You look at the type of person it produces. Okay? This is why Plato thought that uh, you know, uh, music was important for morality, because it orders the body. So you think about what rap does to a person. You look at the fruit of rap. You think of the way the person moves, the way the person dresses, 
the way the person uses his, his or her language. Uh, you look at the lyrics of rap. You look at what the, the, the music does to the mind. You let science dictate that. It's pretty easy to do. Of course, when science gets in the way, uh, then we're, normally what happens is it's the people who once re regarded science as uh, the be-all and end-all discard that and then they drift into pseudoscience to suit their case uh, and call that science. But you let science determine that. Now look at the difference between that uh, and the people coming out of a concert hall, classical concert hall. Now they're very different people, very different people. And they are very different people morally. They are very different people culturally. They are very different people in terms of their overall world vision, how they will treat other people. So music is not something that we take by taste, by arbitrary taste or subjective taste. Music matters because it is fundamental to how a person is created, how a person functions in the world. Um, uh, you know, a uh, society that is founded on popular music would be very different to a society that's founded on classical music. I mean, just look at the difference in the centuries, for example. So the, kind of the question then is, what type of music, and I'm only using music as an example. I mean, uh, the conservationists will use architecture, he use music, he use literature, he use all, all of these things, clothing, manners, uh, and he will say, uh, well, now, what gives me a sense of belonging to this world of which I am a part? You know? I, I don't want to feel alienated. The, 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 the human condition is not an alienated condition. Mm -hmm. You know, we were alienated through the fall, but we've been redeemed from the fall. So how do we get back home? And it's all there for us. You know, those who discard, disregard, for example, the sacred scriptures will never know how to get back home. And because they don't know where they belong. They don't know what home is. You know? So those people, this is why education is of such fundamental importance and cultural education more than anything else. And this was Hegel's great insight. That if you don't, if you're not schooled in religion, philosophy, and art, or art, religion, and philosophy in that order, as Hegel thought, you will always feel alienated from your kind, from your heritage. And that's why you'll end up smashing it, because you resent it and you resent other people. Because you feel alienated. You know, so when you think of, uh, and this is, gives a great kind of uh, excuse uh, and justification to people who go around defacing and, and uh, uh, using graffiti to make a point. Such people are merely venting that they do not belong anywhere. They belong to what Roger Scruton used to call nowhere. Mm -hmm. But you belong somewhere. They want to belong somewhere. So perhaps life chances hasn't given them that you know, setting or context through which they can become part of what uh, Hegel called the objective spirit or objective consciousness. What does that mean? It means the consciousness that stands above us all, that was given to us by previous generations, and that we become one with through study, through reading, through immersing ourselves in the great texts, the great musical scores, the, the you know, the, 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 the treasures of our civilization. And once we do, then we start to feel at home in the world. Then we experience true freedom. You will never feel free, you'll feel bound, and you'll feel alienated if you don't have that. So that sense of home is merely belonging to what we have received, what's been handed down to us, um, and, and connecting with it. And that we're not in connecting with it, we're not connecting with something dead. We're animating ourselves through the spirit of Hegel thought, or the consciousness, the living consciousness of our forebears. Again, my last example on it, think of a book. When you read, what are you doing? You're picking up the book, right? You're picking up the book, you're opening the book, there's the book, and you're reading. On the face of it, nothing but that's all it is, okay? But when you read, that's, you go beyond that, you drift into the book, okay? Mm -hmm. Your mind becomes one with the mind of the author. And when you close the book, where is all the stuff that was in the book? Where is the consciousness that was speaking to you? It's in there. You disregard the book, now it's you, it's part of you. And you've connected with something bigger and better than yourself. And it changes you. And you feel more confident in yourself at a very basic level because now you've found somewhere to settle and belong. So when you do away with that, we are all living nowhere. We're all drifting, we're all alien. And if you want to see what that looks like, again, take a visit to Portland. Mm-hmm.
Thank you, Mark. That's a uh, very profound. I uh, was wondering too how, uh, so we, we know about the, the alien individual, as it were. It seems to me uh, when you read people, like we talked about Dr. John Casey before we came online and um, his critiques of the modern nation state. Um, is it fair to say that the modern nation state, the way it's set up, is somewhat alienated itself? And um, what did Roger have to say about the different variations of the social contract theory, for example, and um, this kind of culture of repudiation as it manifests itself through the nation state? I suppose I would see this, I don't know, I might be wrong, but I would see this in our own country of Ireland, how the modern state seems to repudiate its heritage and wants to change and go along with the Cultural Revolution, but I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Well, I read a number of questions there, uh, and I don't want to bamboozle people with technicalities, so I'll basically just deal with social contract first. Mm -hmm. uh, the social contract was first critiqued by Edmund Burke, and he said, society is, and this is in the page of the Reflections of the Revolution of France, society is indeed founded on a contract but a contract not between the living alone. Okay, so we draw up a contract and we decide what's going to happen with society now. But a contract between the living, the dead, and the unborn. Okay, so it's a contract that is, 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 is kind of a primeval contract uh, between what he called the, uh, for those who, uh, for the living and those who belong to the great eternal society. So our, our, our dead and those who are to come. So when we make decisions, we cannot make them for ourselves alone. Uh, Sinn Féin, okay? <laughs> we can't make our decisions for ourselves alone. We make them by virtue of who we have become. Nobody comes, emerges in a vacuum. That's how we started this conversation. The liberal is, is, is a created entity. We are the product of our dead, and therefore we must factor them into the equation insofar as we take the past into consideration. And the past cannot become a static, stagnant pool. We can't be in full homage to the past. So we have to modify it in, in, a, in relation to new challenges and new priorities and new uh, uh, agendas. But not only our agendas, every decision ought to be made with future generations in mind. Again, what are called absent generations, the dead and the unborn. Now, the problem with the nation state as we see it today is that it does believe, it has drifted into this idea that you can have a contract between the living only. So I, and so we don't want to learn from the past at all, and we don't take any consideration for future generations. So take, for example, uh, the contentious issue of abortion, most recently in our country, for example. Um, now, here we have a situation where the unborn are totally written out of the equation in a very practical way. Okay? But you don't have to just look at abortion. You can look at any decision that is made which does not factor in the possible needs of future generations and which totally disconnects from the wisdom of the past. So if, for example, um, uh, you, you know, you're, you're altering the institution of marriage, for example. Well, you've got to ask yourself, and this, of course, is the, 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 the question that nobody will throw because they, they, they don't want to, because it might, they'd have to face some self-evident truths that might contradict their position. Uh, but, for example, you have to ask yourself, how was, you look at historically, why was marriage formed? How did it emerge? What was the purpose of it? And uh, when did it start to unravel? as the institution that it is. And what are the implications, if it does unravel for us now, if we push that unraveling even further, and how will it fare for future generations? Now, if we do that, then we're having a cross-generational conversation, okay? And that's a real social contract, okay? Where we, we, have, we don't only have the living sitting around the table, but we have goats, okay? Um, uh, the future, as Jacques Derrida very profoundly put it, uh, uh, belongs to ghosts, you know, because the, the people who are not here, okay, those who have informed us about, uh, you know, those who we came from, those who shaped us and molded us, uh, who put the chains of custom around us, wrapped us in the chains of custom, 
and those who are yet to come. They don't have a voice at the table, which is why we have to see ourselves as temporary trustees of the, uh, the, the, the social, moral, political, religious, cultural um, ecology. And if we see ourselves like that, well, then we will always factor us in generation centric. Because it's not, then we won't be seeing ourselves, we'll say to ourselves, well, this is not for us alone. We are, it's a gift handed down to us, and it's a gift that we must preserve and conserve to the best of our ability, modifying it as best we can in light of new arrangements and new challenges, but with a view to those who will inherit it. Because otherwise, you disenfranchise the dead and you disenfranchise the unborn. Now, that's a crime, actually. Um, and you, not only do you, you evict them from their, car, their home. It is going to be the, their home in the future. And it's certainly you're, you're, you're silencing the dead, which is an abomination um, uh, for all the reasons I've tried to point out in our conversation today. Now, the thing is that, uh, so what's the answer to that? Do you, because of the blindness of the present generation and the uh, the stubbornness and the ignorance of the present generation tear down the whole edifice. Now that just seems to me, and I've had discussions with this with Chair Casey before, my good friend Chair Casey, and uh, uh, we disagree on it um, because you know he drifts into a kind of the same type of spirit. The anarchist will drift into the same type of spirit as the revolutionary. You know, I don't believe in tearing things down because if you tear things down, you lose some of that social ecology, a lot of all of that legal ecology, all of that artistic and cultural ecology that we have inherited from the past and which gives us a guide to the future. So you've got to be very careful when you're doing that. Now, but, what, but, but again, does that mean that you can't critique it? No, it certainly does not. Does that mean that you can't put a stop to certain things? No, it certainly does not mean that. What it means is that you actively set about reform the great distinction between reform and revolution and uh and always keeping in mind that you're doing this but that what you're reforming really doesn't belong to you you've got to keep that in mind this is a sacred thing that's been passed to you and that you must pass on so your actions your actions uh will determine uh people's future okay not your future people's future that you do not know yet the future belongs to ghosts remember that and uh, that's why uh, we ought to be very concerned about those who believe uh, against all the uh, philosophical, sociological, um, historical, uh, and scientific evidence to the contrary that uh, social agendas, as we've seen in, in recent years, uh, are, 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 um, ought to be uh, realized irrespective of the consequences for future generations. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it, it may, I may want this now because I have some instinct to do things that other people do just merely because they do it. But if I don't test the tradition and if I don't test the institution and ask why, why, what's the reason behind this institution? What's the reason behind this tradition? What's, what's it saying to us? Uh, what's the, 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 the motivation? of the dead in setting this up and transmitting this, um, well then, uh, I'm only, I'm trying to recreate something that won't bend in that way. And it'll be a disaster. But it won't be a disaster for me because I'll get what I want. But it may be a disaster for your children or your children's children. And uh, so the, the primary thing there is to replace rights with responsibility. Responsibility, that the heavy responsibility that we have as we stand between the giants of the past and, and the future and make our decisions accordingly. But, you know, the selfishness of the rights culture will say, no, we don't have to factor them in at all, uh, as long as we're happy because we're merely going to the grave and we do not have an eternal destiny and we really don't have to think about future generations. So long as we're happy, that's all that counts. Excellent. Thank you, Mark. Would this suggest um, that it would be accurate to describe Roger Scruton as a natural law thinker then? Because whenever you're speaking there, I was thinking of how Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. would talk about the American founding as a promissory note that was yet to be fulfilled and so on. And then you mentioned Edmund Burke. I've seen, I think, Peter Stanless described Edmund Burke as a natural law thinker. Uh, would you put him in a tradition with people like that? And um, 
No, uh, because um, again, you know, it's not as though, because for example, now again, I'm not going to get too technical about this because it, again, I don't bamboozle your listeners but, or your viewers, but the fact is that natural law implies that there is a certain way of doing things that has actually written into nature, which is true uh, in terms of the biological order uh, and the scientific order. Um, and then we can discuss, you know, we could discuss the, um, the religious roots of that, you know, that, that is, is that happen happenstance or is that preordained, um, predetermined. But when it comes to the, the social and cultural and legal foundations of our society, uh, it's more like a, what, what uh, Hayek called the spontaneous order. You know, people come together and through trial and error, a certain order emerges. Okay, a certain a spontaneous, it spontaneously emerges. They can't decide on it before it actually happens. Okay? They don't sit back and say, well, now, uh, we are here, uh, and, and, and what is it we're supposed to do? And they reflect on it, and suddenly the answer is there before them. No. It's through intermingling, in discoursing, uh, engaging, you know, communicating, uh, interacting, that suddenly a, a kind of an order will emerge through trial and error. And that's the way it is. Burke called it credulous. Now, by that he didn't mean unbiased, like a bias. He meant kind of the kind of stuff that we live by that we have found to work. It works. Mm -hmm. Why does it work? Because it produces a sense of uh, order, a sense of belonging, a sense of settlement, which is, um, you know, conducive to the happiness of the vast amount of people that live by it and that orders their days and their nights uh, in accordance with, you know, um, uh, and their behavior, obviously, in accordance with a framework that can be sustained over time and that will accommodate everybody that belongs to that particular community. Now, of course, the spontaneous order is not going to be the same in each society. And that is why societies look different, okay? Just the way families, and this is why the great model for Hegel and Burke and, and, and Scruton and all conservationists uh, and conservatives is, is the family. You look at the way a family operates. Okay, the family has a spontaneous order. When you come together, you say you're hoping to get married next year, you'll find that when you come together as, as husband and wife, the way you kind of build a family and run the home won't be done according to set procedures. You won't come in with your list, you know, how to build a home list. And, 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 and if you do, uh, I suggest that you take a rain check on your marriage, but you won't come in with that list and say, now, the first thing we have to do is set up the dining table, and this is how we're going to have to eat every night. Well, you won't do that. It'll emerge, it'll spontaneously emerge over time. It may resemble, and indeed it will resemble, the kind of formalities that we all adopt in doing such practices, but it will have its own unique brand, its own unique uh, outlook, its own union, and that's why people will enjoy going to your home because it'll be different and it'll look different and it'll sound different and it'll taste different. But it, uh, fundamentally, the structure will be there. But it, you like, as, as, as again, as distinct from different countries, the same thing happens. We do this, but the order looks different. It's, uh, but nonetheless, we do it according to common patterns. Um, and uh, Again, you can see it even in terms of family members. You'll have children, please God, and in the, in the, uh, you'll go into their, their bedrooms and you'll see from the room itself uh, the outlook and the perspective and the values of the child. But it'll all be kind of within the common framework of the family. So the order will look different in each room and it'll be spontaneous because of the, the unique, uh, you know, uh, person that you're dealing with. But nonetheless, you'll find your own feet. And that's the way societies operate. Okay? Uh, nothing, there's nothing uh, codified about that. Uh, and it may be wrong. That may, it may really involve correction along the way. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the order of, of, of some of our children's bedrooms, for example, need to be corrected. 
Why? Not because we're punishing the child, but because it's in the child's best interest to have a different set of values when he or she is operating in terms of how they keep their room and so on and so forth. A very practical example to show you that we're not always right and that things need to be corrected according, not to some overarching thing, but according to the rules of the family. Okay, And each family is unique, as I say. So these things are not written in the soil of the earth. Um, but they do provide us with the only means that we have of judging where we go from here, okay? And that's why it's, it's, it's very important. So I wouldn't like to lock uh, conservationist into that and natural law theory, no. Not rigidly, anyway. Thank you, Mike. And um, just to differentiate it then from, say, a purely Darwinian or a utilitarian perspective, are you suggesting a certain talos then? Um, that the family is ordered to meet, so to speak, or is that how we, may, we might differentiate ourselves from pure Darwinists or, I guess, more liberal uh, utilitarians? Is that fair to say? Yes, I would say that every, I would say that every, um, uh, now one has to be very careful because, um, uh, you see, all modern ideologies are, the word tela, telos, uh, comes from the Greek meaning goal, or is the Greek word for goal, okay? So, the, the, so all modern ideologies are goal-directed. So what do I mean by that? Well, the socialist uh, wants a socialist utopia. That's the goal. So we'll do everything we can to reach that goal, okay? The Marxists used to say that it was inevitable that they would reach that goal. It would just happen, but of course, <laughs> there you there you are. Um, so uh, and 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 uh, then um, what else? The, um, uh, the, the 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 scientific determinist, you know, will have will have a goal. You know, you're you you say right. This is this is kind of you're 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 predetermined to act out this way. Um, you know, you can determine what you're going to do on the basis of neuroscience and you know and so on and so forth. Now, the, the person who prioritizes freedom, real freedom, not the freedom of communist societies, which is no freedom at all, it's freedom from the privilege and few and depth of the many, uh, but real freedom, there won't be that kind of goal that we're, we must reach before we you know, come to utopia. And of course, the, the utopia comes from the, the Greek word utopos, which means no place. You know, we're going to no place. You know, we were, we have a place. We have a settlement, and it's ours, and we love it, and it determines what we do and how we should function. We don't like it when people storm into our home and tell us, "No, you're living a wrong way." We don't like that, and so we don't like it when people do that to our common home either, to our country, um, and to our our community. So, um, and that's another thing that uh, is happening nowadays, where in terms of current cultural revolutions, where people are saying, you know, what should happen to our community and what should happen to our... No, we, no, we don't. That's not the way we function. And I, I wish people would stand up and say, no, no, you, you have no uh, right, you have no privileges to come in and say that the way we have done things here is wrong according to your perspective. We can have a conversation about what may need to be reformed, but not according to ripping up everything and, 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 and remodeling it on your perspective or according to your ideology. So conservationists don't have those predetermined or set goals. Uh, we live uh, in accordance with the, um, with the past, as I told you, mm. always letting our canonized forefathers kind of shine a light on where we've come from, but open to the new initiatives that will inevitably come our way. Um, but modifying the practices of the present by virtue of the past and by virtue of those uh, the, the needs of those who are to come. And we do that the, to the best of our ability. I mean, when, you know, human beings are fragile. You know, we don't always make the right decisions, but we do the best that we can. And if we look at the evidence and we look at, you know, what future generations may aspire to, um, based on the previous practices, which we draw from the past, we can make a fair enough assessment of it. Um, so uh, the goal, so we, we go towards a future that is a kind of, not nebulous, but not predetermined. Okay, not predetermined. And um, 
because otherwise you will frog march your society in, towards that goal with jackboots on you. And uh, that's, we've seen enough of that uh, already. But the fact is, um, and the dire consequences of that, but the fact is that um, uh, you, when it comes to uh, future goals, uh, that doesn't mean that you cannot plan. You must be able to plan. But of course, the plans can come unstuck at any minute. And you've got to be prepared for that too. But again, it's all about what, what, what the, the, the philosophers called reflective equilibrium. That, you, you know, you, you, you judge future actions on the basis of where you are now. You reflect on it. You don't, you know, uh, uh, run out your door and say, I've had enough of this and start tearing up pavement stones and, you know, uh, tearing down courthouses and all of that sort of stuff. Because that's tearing down the heritage and tearing down what belongs to me. What belongs to me, not just you, what belongs to me. So um, I'd be very wary of goals, but the one goal that we all have, and again, this is the great insight of Hegel, is freedom. To be able to live our lives uh, as we wish, without threatening the social order, uh, without threatening each other. And once we learn to live with inside, inside those parameters, we learn to be comfortable within our home and we recognize ourselves as free entities operating within constraints. Uh, I like putting it, uh, but, but operating within constraints, but once we measure up to those constraints, then being able to do what we still wish. I like to put it that, you know, um, rights begin where duties and responsibilities end. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you, Mark. And um, what about the distinctly Christian understanding of love uh, in relation to this conservatism where conservationism, how does that play out then? I think you've already described it implicitly. Is there a way you'd like to formulate it explicitly? What a agape or eros? Uh? Yes, well, I mean, the, the, the great, the, you see, this is the thing, and we, we are, we're so confused about what love means these days. Uh, agape, of course, is a biblical word. I mean, it's, 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 it's uh, comes from the, the, the Greek, obviously, um, but it's, it's kind of a God type. Um, it's not a, a, a philia, uh, a, you know, a, a, a friendship type love. It's not an eros, a sexual or physical love. It's a love that is um, of the type that St. Paul reminds us of in 1 Corinthians 13. A love that seeks not its own, you know. Um, so whether you know, people get bamboozled about this in terms of, and confused about this in terms of how we show or to love as Christians. But it's very, very easy. All you've got to ask yourself is, am I seeking my own? If I am seeking my own, then it's not love. Can't be love. Can't be love. That's a, that's a standard. Um, now, the Bible is very clear on this. And of course, it being one of the founding documents of our civilization. Therefore, it's one of these things that I've been speaking about all the while, uh, if not explicitly, implicitly. Uh, love is the final goal of our instruction, says St. Paul. It's, it's the goal of our instruction, he says to Timothy. Um, uh, you know, faith works through love. You know, so you keep, you keep, the love is the key in every situation. God is love. And you will know the children of God, says St. John, by the way they love. And if you do not love, you're not a child of God. Now, Jesus came to redeem us, uh, to take sin off our back so we'd be returned to our created value. And what is that? A son of God child of God and uh, and therefore we are if, they, if we are and I'll say this to you Mark just in reference to your last question if we are goal directed if there is something written in our hearts okay that supersedes the the, um, uh, the, the, the the social and cultural structures of which out of which we emerge it is it is that that our goal is to love you know uh, and and uh, and that, in terms of what I've been speaking about, it's all about love. I mean, you love, you love, the, you love your past. It's not about loving something that's dead. It's about loving something that's living. It's about loving the ghosts who dwell amongst us. As I look around my room here in my study, I'm looking at hundreds of books that are, they're not books. They're not, they're not paper, as I'm saying, in relation to Thursday. It's not like anywhere. These are people speaking to me. You know, they're ghosts, they're these canonized forefathers that I was speaking to you about earlier. And our, my, my um, goal, as uh, such, 
uh, is to love them. Okay, it's to 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 seek them out, to let them speak. Um, and, and the same way with all of these monuments and, 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 and uh, uh, statues, and, and uh, there's, I'm just using this as an example because of our current predicament, but they are speaking to us. They are telling us of who we are. You know, they're reminding us of whence, or they're reminding us whence we came. Um, and, and likewise, with future generations, our goal is to love them. And of course, love seeks not its own, which is why the biblical injunction which is why salvation history is so totally against rights history or the culture of human rights, which is why they don't like it, which is why every social initiative in the Western world, in the liberal West at least, uh, in the past 50 years, has been to deny the place of salvation history in our common history, or to obscure it at least. If they can't uh, elide it and, and erase it, they try to obscure it because it says love seeks not its own love does not act according to its own necessities but uh, you know thinks always of the other first and that if that that is a life-changing thing I, I mean if you think that if you say to yourself well um the the the, the, the whole purpose of christ's mission was to nail our fall our, our Adamic nature, you know, the, our nature that we received from Adam, mm -hmm. uh, our sin consciousness to the cross, so that we could be returned to our original home, to our original state. And what does that look like? And then he lived out the life for us, which is modeled in the Gospels. And he said, follow me, do this. And what did he do? Love seeks not its own. He gave his life. He said, each day, Lay down your life, take up your cross, and follow me. Okay, it means crucify yourself, crucify your old man, as Saint Paul puts it in, in Romans. You know, crucify that to the cross, nail it to the cross, be done with it. You are a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things, all things. Now, one thing, all things have been made, right? And therefore, if you are a new creation. Uh, then you will seek not your own. You will gladly crucify yourself. And that is, a, you'll gladly crucify the ego, you'll gladly crucify self-preoccupation, you'll gladly crucify, uh, crucify self-consciousness. All of those things, oh, my feelings, no more feelings. You don't live by the flesh, you live by the spirit. You are part of the old, you're not part of the old things, you're part of the new things. And you'll crucify your rights, okay? So, you know, uh, rights begin only when duties to others and responsibilities to others ends. And if you see life like that, you'll be a natural conservationist because you'll be thinking about conserving things for others, helping others, uh, maintaining what they've given you, maintaining the debt that you have to the past. Are you thinking about future generations? Are you thinking about present generations in light of all of these things? So you can't live a, a, a full, flourishing human existence without uh, that form of, of, of crucifixion. But of course, the cross doesn't sit well with the human rights culture. It doesn't, it contradicts it entirely, which is why they want cross as crucifixes out of the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much for that, Mark. That's very profound. Um, is it just before we close then, because I'm conscious that I've taken up a bit of your time. So is there anything else that you're working on at the moment or that you still feel a passion to get involved with in the future that you'd like to tell us about? Well, there's always something uh, going, but I mean, ever since Roger died in um, in uh, January, uh, uh, the, flood, the floodgates have opened, and, and uh, because I suppose I'm synonymous with him now, um, um, there's all sorts of essays and, and um, yeah, projects to do with that. Um, currently, actually, um, I'm, I've, I've just written a, a piece defending him against. Um, just a, while we're on the topic, defending him against those who believe that he was an atheist. I mean, there's kind of, nothing more ludicrous. Uh, um, and, and friends of his who think this. Um, but um, but that's a, that's, that's a, a con any any serious reader of his works cannot come away with that idea. Yes, that there's there's a great uh, for those of you who are interested in Marx, they'll find very quickly that he was a great fan of Richard Wagner. And in fact, his last book uh, was um, uh, that was just posthumously published, 
uh, recently um, was on Parsifal. And uh, this is part of the third in a trilogy of books um, that he wrote on, on uh, Tristan and Isolde, the, the opera, the, the Wagnerian opera, and The Ring. So this was the last work in that series. So they assume, therefore, because he liked Wagner, that he must be an atheist. Um, because Wagner tries to you know, give you a sense of how to live, uh, you know, uh, as though um, the gods were dead, but as though you can live in the light of um, the gods of culture. Um, um, but nothing could be further from the truth because of everything that I've been saying to you uh, here uh, earlier on with regard to the sacred uh, and, and uh, with regard to uh, the distinction between um, you know, the scientific worldview and the sacred worldview that he held. Um, he, he once he had a great quote, you know, which um, ties in with what we've been saying uh, in the last 15 minutes or so. And it's this, when you look at human beings as objects, you see that everything that Darwin said about them was true. When you look on them as subjects or persons, you see that the most important thing about them is missing from Darwin's theory. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in that one sentence, which I gave to you verbatim, by the way, um, that poses huge challenges to the scientific worldview. It doesn't undermine it. No, no. Uh, and anybody who thinks that, uh, that, that, that the, 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 the object of a philosophy or theology is to do away with science or to deny science, um, you know, really ought to give it up because, you know, that's not the, the case at all. Science sh sheds a glorious light shines a glorious light across, across the creation universe. Um, um, Roger used to say it tells us all about the how of the universe, but it doesn't tell us about the why. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's, that's the big distinction. So science has a place and a very important fundamental place. Um, but, you know, there's always uh, one uh, rung on the, uh, the, the ladder of causation which it just never manages to step up on. So Stephen Hawking tells us, well, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the laws of, of gravity uh, are answer the, question, the great questions of the universe. Well, the, the obvious re rejoinder to that is, well, where do the laws of gravity come from? So there's always one more question that, they have, that one has to beg uh, and uh, until they can definitively answer that final question, whatever it might be, um, we, 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 are left, uh, we are left with, uh, with, with uh, the, the, the old world view intact. Um, so we, we, we've got to be, uh, when, we're, when, we're, um, when we're discussing, you know, uh, people like Roger Scruton and the nuanced view that they have of, um, of religion and, and, and spirituality and so on, um, uh, you know, we've got to look at things very carefully and very concisely and not jump to any conclusion. So, yes, the old, they might not come out with the traditional proofs of the existence of God, or they might not have a formulated theology, but in and, in and through the philosophy, you catch glimpses of, of things that are terribly profound and, and life-changing, um, uh, if, if, if you're prepared to probe them. But, you know, the thing about, the thing about uh, the, the, the um, getting back to what I was saying earlier about the, 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 the Gospels, um, you know, one of the great things that I think we will do, one of the great uh, events of the 21st century is if we allow the Gospels to fall silent. And I think this is the great movement. I, I probably finish, finish on this. This is the great movement uh, of the 20th century, of the 21st century, is to actually silence, to close the covers of the Gospel for good, you know. And... Um, I think that's inevitably where the rights culture wants to take you. So uh, it's not about opposing it with fire, because we have enough fire. So it's not fire against fire. Uh, but I think if you were to be, if you were to follow certainly the, uh, the, um, uh, the message of people like Roger Scruton or the people that I've been mentioning today, uh, or any of you people who are interested in, in, in your common home, uh, you should oppose it with love. You know, that's why I often describe Roger um, in many of my books as a philosopher of love. Um, and I, I believe all of those people that I've mentioned today are philosophers of love because 
Again, love, you, you, there's no responsibility to that one. I mean, think of the word responsibility. It's based on a response to. You respond to people. You respond to their needs. You respond to their, their, uh, their requests. You respond to their... Um, you respond to the, 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 the character who's lying on the other side of the road, half beaten to death, as, 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 as a good Samaritan. You respond, respond, respond. Again, let it be a guiding scruple. Love seeks not its own. And let that be the example of your life. If you let that be the example of your life, well, then you will be by, uh, essentially different from most people today. And uh, your life will speak to those people. And they will, please God, say, well, that person has something different to me. You know, what is it? What is that thing that is so different? Uh, of course, we know that the thing is that you don't think of you all the time. <laughs> you think of them. And perhaps in modeling that out, in doing as, as the sacred texts tell you to do, uh, they will uh, emulate you. They will say, well, you be, because nowadays people who believe that, that love seeks not its own, and live their lives by that, uh, are the exception. And exceptions always, always, in every period of human history, become the role models for the many. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Mark. It's been a pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you very much, Mark. God bless you.